We've entered an entirely new chapter in the Starship program, the era of Starship Block 3. And even though its first flight is now rapidly approaching, most people still don't fully understand just how radical this vehicle really is. That's because Block 3 isn't a simple upgrade. It isn't an iteration. It's a fundamental redesign, a clean break from everything that came before it. This is the real story of Starship Block 3 and why it changes everything. The Booster 18 accident, while undeniably a setback, happened at a critical moment as SpaceX continues to push the program at an unprecedented pace. But for engineers, analysts, and dedicated Starship watchers, it also delivered something incredibly rare. The first truly clear look inside the newest Super Heavy booster. And what that look revealed tells us exactly where SpaceX is headed. One of the most important revelations was how Super Heavy Version 3 handles its propellants, and why SpaceX completely rethought the internal plumbing to dramatically improve landing reliability. Let's start with liquid oxygen. In Block 3, the massive central oxygen transfer tube is gone. Instead of piping oxygen down through the center of the vehicle, the entire outer tank itself is filled with liquid oxygen. When valves open, oxygen flows straight downward into the engines through short, direct feed paths. At first glance, you can see a dense network of lines feeding the engine section, but many of these lines aren't propellant at all. They carry pressurization gas, control systems, and instrumentation. Because the oxygen tank remains fully filled during ascent, there's no longer any need for a dedicated oxygen pipe feeding the outer Raptor 3 engines. The result is a simpler, shorter, and far more robust oxygen delivery system. Methane, however, is handled very differently. Liquid methane is stored in the upper tank, which means it still has to travel the entire length of the booster to reach the engines. To accomplish that, Super Heavy V3 uses a massive central methane transfer tube, one SpaceX has described as roughly the diameter of a Falcon 9. It's almost like a rocket built inside another rocket. This tube is heavily reinforced because it experiences extreme structural loads throughout flight. Early on, the surrounding liquid oxygen pushes inward on the tube. Later, once the oxygen is depleted, methane pressure pushes outward instead. Add in aerodynamic forces and the stresses of a precision tower landing, and the structure must survive brutal conditions from liftoff to touchdown. At the bottom of the methane tank, the flow splits into dozens of individual lines feeding all 33 engines. But the most unusual and important new feature in Block 3 is the side-mounted tank. This tank exists to solve one of the hardest problems SpaceX has faced, reliable booster landings. By the time Super Heavy returns for a tower catch, most of its propellant has already been burned. Any remaining liquid oxygen in the main tank can slosh, break apart, or ingest gas, risking engine starvation during the final landing burn. To eliminate that risk, SpaceX added a dedicated liquid oxygen header tank mounted on the side of the booster. This tank remains mostly full throughout the flight and is reserved exclusively for landing. During ascent and early burns, oxygen is drawn from the main tank. After the boost back burn, Valves switch so the inner engines are fed from the side-mounted header tank instead. That way, when Super Heavy ignites its engines for final descent and tower catch, the oxygen supply is stable, clean, and predictable. Combined with the central methane transfer tube, this architecture keeps both propellants under precise control right up to the moment of capture. This brings us to one of the biggest questions surrounding Block 3, especially when compared to Version 2. On V2, the hot staging ring sat between the ship and booster and intentionally blocked part of one side. That asymmetry shaped exhaust flow during staging, helping the booster initiate its flip in a preferred direction as the ship's engines ignited. In simple terms, part of the flip was driven by exhaust geometry. In Block 3, that system is gone. Hot staging is now fully integrated into the booster itself. There's no sacrificial ring, no one-sided shielding. So did SpaceX abandon flip control? Not even close. Instead, SpaceX moved flip control deeper into the physics of the vehicle. The first major change is ignition sequencing. The exact order and timing of Raptor vacuum and sea level engines on the ship now matter far more than physical barriers. Even tiny differences in ignition timing and thrust buildup 
can generate asymmetric plume forces. At staging, when the vehicles are extremely close together, those forces couple efficiently and can impart a powerful rotational impulse. The second change is geometry. The rounded interstage dome dramatically alters how exhaust flows across the surface. Instead of clinging to sharp edges, exhaust now slides and wraps smoothly around curvature. Plume impingement is guided by shape rather than blocked by structure. As the booster peels away, the plume sweeps across the dome and the geometry determines exactly where heat and force concentrate. This is why Block 3 uses targeted reinforcement plates instead of uniform shielding. Booster 18 gave us an extraordinary heat map view of this system. Outer patches provide broad protection, while inner plates sit directly beneath each vacuum and sea level engine. The third factor is deliberate asymmetry, and this is where the missing grid fin matters. By removing one grid fin, SpaceX intentionally biases mass, drag, and thermal tolerance in a single direction. That asymmetry works together with plume forces to favor a consistent flip direction without relying on large external hardware. This leads to the question of offset RVAC shielding, especially since RVAC engines don't gimbal. One compelling explanation is this. While the engines themselves are fixed, their exhaust is not. At staging altitude, ambient pressure is still high enough that RVAC exhaust is underexpanded, meaning atmospheric pressure pushes the plume inward toward the vehicle's center line. When combined with centrally mounted sea level engines and their gimbling, the exhaust behaves like a single, flexible flow field rather than isolated jets. As the booster rotates away, this combined plume sheet sweeps across the dome. Even a non-gimbling engine can generate asymmetric heating and force if its plume is bent or redirected by nearby exhaust and vehicle motion. Instead of relying only on ignition timing, SpaceX can now use gimbling in a preferred direction during pull-away to steer the combined plume. This increases impingement on one side of the dome, creating both thermal loading and a reaction force that drives rotation. It's more precise, more tunable, and eliminates the need for disposable structures. Block 3 doesn't remove flip control. It replaces a blunt mechanical solution with plume physics, geometry, gimbling strategy, and intentional asymmetry. Now let's move to the upper stage. At first glance, Starship 5-3 may look similar to earlier versions, but beneath the surface, it has been extensively rebuilt. One of the most visible additions is the pair of external docking adapters. These ports closely match those shown in SpaceX's orbital refueling renders, and that's exactly their purpose. They allow two starships to dock in orbit and transfer propellant. This capability is absolutely essential for missions to the moon and beyond. Even though Starship carries enormous amounts of fuel, most of it is consumed just reaching orbit. Orbital refueling makes the remaining roughly 400,000 kilometers, about 250,000 miles, to the moon possible, and it opens the door to Mars. Other visible updates include relocated Starlink terminals, an updated catch pin system, and numerous internal weld refinements. The docking ports are now fully exposed, and the heat shield features a cleaner, tapered edge. Notably, Starship no longer uses traditional lift points. Ground handling now relies entirely on the catch pin and stabilizer interfaces. Block 3 also introduces protective jacketing for COPV tanks, composite overwrapped pressure vessels. COPVs are extremely strong and lightweight, but they can still be damaged during handling. To prevent this, SpaceX added segmented orange metal shells with foam padding underneath, designed to absorb impacts and protect the tanks. One of the most critical upgrades in Starship Block 3 is the Raptor 3 engine. On December 3rd, SpaceX released a stunning video showing Raptor 3 running for more than six minutes, simulating a full ascent burn. For the first time, we saw an extended, uninterrupted look at this engine in action. As the test continued, Ice formed across the powerhead, visible proof of Raptor 3's active external cooling system. The concept is deceptively simple. By actively cooling the engine externally, SpaceX can eliminate heavy shielding. Removing that shielding saves mass, and mass is everything. Seeing this approach work in real time marks a major leap forward. In terms of raw performance, Raptor 3 is a monster. Each engine 
produces roughly 280 tons of thrust at sea level, delivers a specific impulse near 350 seconds, and weighs about 1,525 kilograms, or roughly 1,720 kilograms when vehicle-side hardware is included. And SpaceX isn't stopping there. Elon Musk has stated the goal is 300 tons of thrust per engine. If achieved, a fully loaded Super Heavy with 33 Raptors would generate an astonishing 10,000 tons of thrust at liftoff. So when could the first Block 3 flight actually happen? SpaceX has publicly targeted Starship Flight 12 for the first quarter of 2026. To reach that milestone, several elements must align. The Massey test site for cryogenic and static fire testing, Pad 2, 39, Flight Ready Raptor 5, 3 engines, Booster 19, and Ship 39. Some optimistic projections point to late January, around January 26th. A more realistic estimate places the first flight in February 2026. For the first Block 3 vehicle, several months of build time will likely be required before pressure and cryogenic testing can begin. Massey should be operational by then, and engine commissioning may be relatively fast. Ship 39 could then require about a month for static fire testing, followed by a few additional weeks to finalize launch readiness. Booster 19 and Pad 2 commissioning timelines remain less certain, but could align within the same window. SpaceX will almost certainly want to analyze the results of Flight 12 before fully committing to Ship 40 and Booster 20. That could create a six to eight week gap between flights 12 and 13, with launch intervals potentially shrinking to around three weeks afterward if no major issues arise. Starship Block 3 is, without question, a wild beast, fundamentally different from anything that came before it. Preparing a vehicle like this takes time, and setbacks are inevitable. It may face challenges on the test stand, and it may even fail on its first flight. But that's the price of progress. If humanity wants to move forward, we have to step beyond the safe bubble and push into the unknown, attempting what only a few years ago would have sounded impossible.